Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, okay, it's a little bit cold up here, um, so I'm going to try and warm you up with some anecdotes and a time-travelling tour of London as well. Um, so, what I love about this city, and just look at it, we can see it splayed out into the distance, that's London, um, is just the fact now, I'm a historian, so I'm fascinated by evoking alien worlds and trying to understand the mindset uh, of the people who populated these alien worlds. And uh, London, uniquely, you can really feel the presence of the past in the present-day city in a way that is unusual in a kind of uh, European context. I just got back from Athens um, this weekend, and uh, there you have the kind of ancient historical tradition, but it's quite confined, whereas in London um, you need only look um, out there uh, and we can see the Shard, which we've been kind of talking about, this kind of apogee of architectural modernity, kind of um, staring across at the Tower of London, which I can't actually see. Can anyone see the tower? Uh, the tower is kind of down there somewhere, um, built out of uh, cayenne stone by William the Conqueror in an effort to, literally to petrify his power uh, to lord it over a city that was so proud of its independence and autonomy. And uh, when I was writing this book that uh, Eleanor was mentioning there, um, we were trying to work out how you would actually slide through time. Because um, you can't have a real time machine in a work of popular history, that would be far too cheesy. Um, so we uh, sort of came up with the idea um, of using portals. Um, and uh, again, all you need to do is walk down any of these streets that we can see in front of us and you stumble across something that might be uh, a strange street name, uh, it might be a kind of blue plaque or a building, uh, but then you're instantly transported into a different world. Um, so if we begin over there um, towards the Tate Modern, um, you can find uh, a kind of small inconspicuous, you can't see it from here, but, it's, uh, but it is down there. It's a small inconspicuous uh, little alleyway called Bear Gardens. Anyone, anyone know that? It's very near the Globe Theatre. Um, and uh, this has kind of got a secret history, because when we think of Bankside, we think of the theatres, we think of uh, the Globe and the uh, Rose and all the rest of them. But in fact, those timbered, spherical theatres were only really there for a period of about 50 years. And uh, they sat cheek by jowl with um, something that was an incredibly cruel, contrived instance of torment, which was the kind of most popular spectator sport for kind of over about 500 years. Uh, and that was, as you know, because um, Rosie foreshadowed it, this was bull and bear baiting. Um, so if you were to walk down there circa 1603, a very different city, the population would be around 200,000. That's including, of course, the city, Westminster and Southwark. Um, you'd kind of walk down and you'd find this kind of thing that would look like a kind of rickety caricature of, a kind of, of the Roman Colosseum. And you'd go in and it would be absolutely deafening. It would be the kind of bawling and the screaming and the shouting that would really hit you first. Uh, and then you'd be subjected to what you would consider like completely inappropriate and distasteful entertainment. Um, uh, you would begin by sitting in the galleries and you'd see a bear. No, not a bear, a bull. And a bull would have his kind of uh, a chain. And uh, this would be tied to a stake which would be sunk deep into the ground, uh, and there'd be men with white sticks with uh, fearsome mastiff dogs prowling around uh, the perimeter. And uh, after a while, the dogs would be released and the whole crowd would go wild. They would scream, go dog, go bull. Uh, and uh, both of these sort of animals would have their kind of snout as close to the ground as possible and they would slither along. The bull would, um, probably, that wasn't the glass, was it? <laughs> Um, okay, it would try and get its horns underneath the dog and flip it up through the air as high as possible, kind of like a pancake. Uh, and John Evelyn and Samuel Pepys both recall <laughs> um, seeing dogs flipped so high up they actually landed on the shoulders um, of spectators. So that's round one. Round two, you do a similar sort of thing, but it's not with a bull anymore, it's with a bear. Um, but the bears, rather nastily, have had their teeth broken short. Um, so they can't bite the mastiff dogs, so the only means available to them is to suffocate them. Um, so the kind of dogs again creep along, and uh, the, the bears, you know, from the galleries, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the bears were giving them a cuddle um, until you saw the lifeless body of the dog slumped to the ground, the bear shaking his head in victory and his um, muzzle 
um, smeared in slobber and blood. Um, so it's, it's quite an unpleasant pastime, but you think that's bad. Uh, the next round, they bring on uh, a blind bear, a specially blinded bear, who has to stand in a circle of 12 men who just whip it over and over again. Um, and in 1554, one such bear had the last laugh and dived into the crowd and bit off a man's leg. Um, and then finally, it, it, that, that's, that's not the extent of it. Uh, the, the final round is that uh, you see a donkey brought in uh, with a baboon on its back, and then the dogs are released. Uh, and the idea is that the kind of the baboon and the donkey are kind of killed, and just to give it an extra sparkle, quite literally, you have fireworks tied to the back of the baboon. Um, so it's in this kind of frenzied state, and you end up with the dogs kind of hanging off the ears of the donkey, like these sort of gruesome earrings. Stop, yeah, exactly, stop. But this is what went on on Bankside for over 500 years. How on earth did this come to pass? This is first mentioned uh, in the diaries of Fitzstephen in the 12th century, and uh, audiences would quite happily watch you know, the, the slaughter at the bear baiting arena one day, uh, and then a philosophically searching play like Hamlet the next day. And uh, the, these two traditions collide. There's a very famous line, exit pursued by a bear in the winter's tale. And uh, Sackerson was one of the most famous bears. He was like a celebrity. Uh, and uh, he is mentioned in uh, The Merry Wives of Windsor, uh, I think. And uh, the king and the queen, they absolutely love this. Uh, the queen travels down. She never bothers to go to the globe, but she loves the bear baiting. Uh, and it's just a reminder um, that it was a very different age. It, it tells us about the kind of trenchant brutality and the hot-bloodedness um, of this age. And uh, there are more prosaic reasons as well. Um, Rosie was talking about the kind of visibility of food in old London, uh, and it was believed that the kind of beef was much tastier if it had been baited by the dogs beforehand. And it was actually illegal to sell beef that hadn't been, uh, had the, the kind of the animals baited uh, beforehand. So um, th this is what would greet you if you had a typical kind of afternoon out um, on Bankside. So you'd leave your bear baiting arena and you would make your way towards what is now and what was then London Bridge, uh, but it had a very different appearance um, back in 1603. Um, Bill Bryson referred to it as a sort of Tudor Bond Street. Um, it was kind of piled high with the finest houses in London, uh, including Nonsuch Palace, which was this kind of Baroque um, kind of architectural migraine that was kind of right in the middle of it. Um, uh, an, an Icelandic diarist visits in 1615, and he notes that they have uh, amazing fast food on the bridge, which just consists of a trap door, kind of like where the glass is over there, and they just put their kind of fishing rods into the water and kind of reel up the fish and then slam it uh, between bread. And then that's given to the people who are eating in the tavern. Um, but it, was, uh, it wasn't all kind of fun and games. Um, one other thing that used to happen, and we're going back now to the 13th century, was that um, all the traffic and the commotion, and it was very congested, London Bridge. It took sometimes up to two hours to get across it because it was so congested. But everything used to grind to a halt at a certain period of time, this is back in the 13th century, because uh, the king had been given a white polar bear by the Norwegian monarch. Uh, and this white polar bear was taken every single afternoon by his Norwegian keeper on a lead out of the Tower of London, where he lived with the other animals, and then he, he went diving for his supper. So all the citizens of London would stop and see this kind of beautiful white polar bear clambering out with a salmon or a sturgeon between his uh, jaws. Um, it was something to leaven the grind of the working day. Um, and uh, those of you, have you actually walked over that and looked down into the yeah. water? I mean, it sort of takes a warm imagination indeed to kind of convert that sort of icy, swirling river into the kind of, um, you know, the, the poetic river, the kind of silver streaming Thames of poetic lore, or the kind of impossibly crystalline turquoise oasis that kind of appears in the paintings of Canaletto. Um, and it was indeed lethal. Um, you would have seen uh, rapids over the 19 arches of London Bridge. You can see something of it again if you look down, uh, and uh, something that the boatmen uh, used to do, and this was the main method of transport then, was to shoot the rapids, which was to kind of go through them, and you sort of go down this kind of seven foot gap, and uh, legions of folk kind of perished underneath the arches of London Bridge. So we've reached the other end, and uh, we're in a completely different era. We're now back in medieval London, um, which was a very alien place to live. Uh, population 40,000. This is in the late 14th century. This was a walled city, um, which is something that we kind of can't really begin to fathom anymore. I mean, we were talking about sort of urban density earlier, and this was a, a, a swarm 
of kind of urban population. Um, but everything could be locked up like a fortress each night. And uh, when the bells rang at the kind of four allotted churches, the whole city would fall into a deep slumber. All the ships would come bankside to moor, and the Thames was patrolled by two um, warships, which is just a, a kind of wherry with archers in it, who would shoot anyone who was caught out uh, on the river late at night. Um, and if you were to walk through this strange city, I mean, more people lived in Roman Londinium than lived in late medieval London, um, you would find things that, again, are quite hard for us to fathom. Um, in places a bit like this, obviously not this, because this hadn't been built yet, but um, in, in sort of towers and gatehouses, you'd find the strange phenomenon of anchorites. Um, and this is something we don't have anymore, um, but there were about 11 or 12 of them all over the city. And uh, these were people who had completely of their own volition just decided they wanted to spend the rest of their life in a tiny cell um, and never leave it. It would be about six foot by four foot, like a kind of solitary confinement wing in a modern US jail. Um, and uh, they decided they want to give up um, the kind of worldly pleasures and the sort of concerns of the commerce-driven city and just sublimate all their physical impulses and carnal urges into a perpetual contemplation of God. Uh, and they, were, they thought this was a way of achieving their own salvation and through constant prayer, the salvation of others as well. And uh, these individuals were taken to the local church, um, happened quite a lot in St. Peter's Cornhill. Uh, they had to lie flat on the ground. Uh, they were then led to the altar um, where extreme unction was um, administered, which was normally reserved for the dead or the dying. Um, they were then led by the hand by the priest and literally immured, walled into this tiny cell which they would never leave for the rest of their life. So people spent 10, 20, 30, 40, sometimes even 50 years uh, in these places. And we know this because they were quite revered figures within the community because they were so spiritually pure, they would intercede for you. Um, they were also in a pre-banking era, perfect safety deposit boxes as well, um, and receptacles of unwanted gossip from time to time. And uh, the whole thing was incredibly trying and grueling. There's a, a 13th century handbook for anchoresses would anyone read it? It's, it's a great document. I heartily recommend it. Um, and it sort of describes that these anchoresses, they said, you must kind of pick up each day the earth in which you shall rot, um, ostensibly so your skin doesn't become too soft and subtle. Um, but in fact, it was a kind of memento mori because you're actually staring into your very own open grave. Because when they died, they weren't taken out. They were just buried. Uh, and then the next anchorite would come in on top. So you'd have this kind of... Um, pile of anchorites. Um, and uh, these people lasted until the Reformation when they were driven out. Um, but they were a slightly unnerving presence as you walk past kind of bridges and gate towers. And uh, they had one window onto the high altar so they could share in the redemption of mankind. But most people would sort of hear them and see them as these slightly kind of shadowy figures. So we're going to take our leave of the anchorites now because some of you are looking really quite horrified after that. <laughs> and we find ourselves somewhere all together more civil and sophisticated. This is early Georgian London, the year is 1716. The population, anyone know what the population of early Georgian London was? No, okay. It was, uh, oh, I don't know, I've forgotten now. 615,000, it was the biggest city in Europe. By 1800, it would become the biggest city in the world. It looked very different to medieval London and Shakespearean London. Um, I was gonna point out a kind of mock Tudor building over there, but it's pitch black, so we can't see it. But that old kind of vernacular of the kind of lurching gables and the timber frame buildings had been um, completely rendered obsolete by the Great Fire. And this is a landscape of tall, elegant, neoclassical brick townhouses. Uh, it's a city of fine streets and squares, but also one of brutality and squalor and crime, of rotting offal left to kind of fester in back streets and of sinister link boys luring you um, into a kind of trap where you'd be mugged by a footpad. Uh, and of course, if you were anyone who was anyone, you'd be traveling by sedan chair, um, which were the taxis of the day. And uh, you could tell a sedan chair was available because the, the kind of the burly Irish bearers would be carrying it backwards. Um, so that's a kind of uh, the yellow taxi sign equivalent uh, of the day. And we're going to go to Covent Garden, which was the meridian of fashion um, initially in the 17th century. By the 18th century, it had descended into a gin and opium fueled Bohemia, um, the first Bohemia in the world, if we believe um, one prominent historian. Um, so it was a hub of prostitution, but also in 1716, which is where we're at, it was the site of one of the most famous 
coffee houses in the whole of uh, the city, um, if not the country. And this was Button's Coffee House, which was opened in 1712 at the behest of uh, the great wit, Joseph Addison. And uh, he was a man who did not get on with his wife uh, particularly well. And latterly, whenever he had quarrels with his wife, he would just retreat into the coffee house because coffee houses used to um, brand themselves as sort of enclaves of rational thought and uh, civility. And by the logic of the day, women were not capable of such things. Um, so any woman seen inside it was assumed she was a prostitute, unless she was sort of the buxom woman pouring out your coffee. Um, so it was a very masculine world, uh, but beyond that, they were reasonably egalitarian spaces. So you would get out of your sedan chair, you'd see the sign of the Turk's head squeaking and creaking in the wind above you, and you'd walk in only to be engulfed in a whirlwind of smoke and sweat and steam, and every single person in there would scream the words, what news have you? Um, and that's the thing, although it only cost a penny to get in, that was the real currency, news and gossip and information. And because this was Addison's coffee house, it soon evolved into an emporium of wits where all the great writers of London would emerge and sit around these long communal tables, making and breaking literary reputations in the process. So getting a recommendation from them was like getting a retweet from Stephen Fry today. People would be <laughs> rushing, um, which I try and get quite frequently, but he never replies. Um, <laughs> people would be rushing to uh, St Paul's Churchyard and ripping the book off the shelves. Uh, and watching all this um, was a curious, probably the most surreal medium of literary communication ever invented, which was a lion wizard's head made of marble, nailed to the wall. And uh, it had huge sort of gaping wide sort of jaws and the public were invited to feed it with letters and limericks and stories. And Joseph Addison would go through all of this um, every week and the very best of the Lion's Digest, as he called it, would be published in a special weekly edition of the original Guardian newspaper, because the Guardian was around before the Manchester Guardian, uh, called The Roarings of the Lion. So through the medium of this thing, writing by unknown authors could be beamed far beyond the kind of smoky, convivial walls of buttons, way out into the country at large, uh, and then people might be reading that, they'd write back with their opinion, then that would be printed in a sort of loop of feedback and amplification, um, much like the internet today. Um, Buttons flourished until, I believe, 1719, when Addison died and the whole thing collapsed because it was celebrities, really, that kept coffee houses afloat. But for those six years, this was one of the most exciting places in the whole city, even though the coffee was absolutely stomach-wrenchingly vile. Um, no one could uh, palate this kind of uh, bitter Mohammedan gruel. But this is where you went for sparkling conversation and wit. The idea was you could talk to anyone, you were meant to talk to as many strangers as you could. People saw themselves as little particles, and the more you collided, the more polish you became. And there's an etymological link between polish and politeness and politesse. Do you know what it is today? Uh, this was 10 Russell Street. It's a Starbucks today, yeah. Um, uh, there's not even a blue plaque commemorating it. Uh, the history's been erased. It's one of London's lost coffee houses. Yeah, I will, yeah. yeah, with your help, with your help. Um, and yeah, and, and, and this is actually how I was going to conclude. You've sort of done my job for me. I mean, there, there, there are all these sort of hidden sites um, dotted about the city, and if you get a chance to go time traveling in London, I hope you do, um, then it, it's more than just having fun. It's actually holding up a mirror to the way we interact today. Imagine going to a Starbucks and sitting down next to a stranger and saying, what news have you? Uh, or <laughs> dissecting a dolphin, as Isaac Newton once did. Um, is the anchorite's life not in some ways desirable when we have this sort of frenzied world with all these demands on our attention? Are there not days where we just think, I wish I could spend the rest of my life in a six by four cell, being revered by the rest of the community? <laughs> Maybe that's just me. Um, OK, thank you very much. I hope you're not too cold. Um, and what happens now? More drinking, is it? Or Oh, it's, it's it, right. That's it. That's it, okay. There we go.